All right, y'all, we are back, and I don't know about you guys, but I hope you're prepping for this impending Casper Ruud Roland Garros title run in a couple weeks. You know, the seas have parted, and it appears the tennis gods are saying, let there be Casper Ruud, and I am all for it, 100%. Y'all can keep getting off your zero big title jokes while you still can. Those days are numbered. But now in all seriousness, who do we call the Roland Garros favorite right now? It feels like ever since, you know, 2020 post-pandemic as Rafa Nadal, you know, the gatekeeper on clay has been weakening more and more as the years have gone by. It's become more of a wide open Roland Garros. But that being said, I don't think anybody saw you know, stuff bottoming out the way it has this year's clay court season, especially up top, especially with the way that the year began with, you know, Yannick Sinner on this absolute tear, Carlos Alcaraz putting it back together, big win in Indian Wells, and, you know, Novak Djokovic still someone who, you know, if you've watched the sport within the last you know, two decades or so, you have to have an appropriate level of fear for and respect for. And, you know, even through Sunshine Double, it seemed like those three were going to be the guys, depending on how the Nadal comeback went. Maybe you'd add his name to the mix, but we stand here at the time of this recording with all three of those guys for one reason or the other very vulnerable at the moment as far as we know and as for the impending return of Rafael Nadal you know I think I had it right the first time obviously the fan in me couldn't stay dormant and I ended up kind of last minute plunging into a take and into the feelings that I totally wasn't intending on having going into this year going into this year I was intending on coming in with zero expectations, you know, kind of taking things as they went. If big things happened, big things happened. And if they didn't, that was kind of the expected outcome this time for the first time for me. And if you've followed this channel, you know I'm a diehard Rafael Nadal fan. I never have been as invested and hardcore of a fan for anybody in any sport, any profession, as I am with Rafael Nadal for the last decade plus. And so obviously with the stop-start nature of his career, throughout all these comebacks, I've never doubted him that he'd come back. Even on this channel, back in 2021, you can see at that point, it was as loud as ever that he was finished then. I still believed he would be back. I did not believe he was done then. This time, however, is obviously different. It does me no pleasure in saying this that Nadal is not Nadal anymore. And as I said, that's fine. That is to be expected. He is a 37, soon to be 38 year old with a battered body who has hardly played in the last year and a half. Expecting him to return to his former glory would be definitely a bridge too far. I don't think even he's expecting that. He's just really attempting to finish his career out on court. And given the thanks, the reception he's received everywhere he goes, I do think that all that hard work just to be able to make his way back on court has been worth it just for that. But as it pertains to this clay court season and Roland Garros prospects, it feels really weird to say, but Nadal here is more of a dangerous floater who's going to, you know, need a kind draw, very matchup dependent for him in this physical state. And over the last couple of years, you know, we've been trending towards this as Nadal's weakened more and more. You've seen a lot of new faces lift up these big titles on clay, particularly at the Masters. That is very much a product of Rafa's clay dominance easing up. But what's different this year even from last year when Rafa wasn't even able to play is that the hierarchy was still very well established it was Djokovic having such a great start to the year you knew he would be a factor 
Alcaraz. Those two really stuck out last year, seemed to be on a collision course from the day the draw was made. Carlos, on the other hand, a guy that has been the best player on clay, at least within the clay court seasons the last two years. Me personally, heading into clay court season just off of that pedigree, I was looking at him as the favorite for Roland Garros and throughout the clay court season, but of course this arm injury has thrown a wrench in things for him. One tournament he did play was in Madrid, slated to play Monte Carlo, Barcelona, and he couldn't make it to either when he did play in Madrid. He didn't hide the fact that, you know, he still wasn't feeling all that confident in the arm, not able to accelerate, not confident enough to accelerate 100% on his forehand. Lost to Andre Rublev at a venue that he had been the two-time defending champion. Leaving the tournament with many of those questions about his physical state still very much in play especially now as he was unable to play rome so he's going to be coming into the french open unless he plays one of these tune-ups in the week before roland garros only off those four matches he played in madrid which you know if he's a hundred percent i wouldn't really worry about at roland garros but that is the prerogative and if he's not a hundred percent if he's anything like he was when he played in madrid even at a tournament where he likes the conditions, has had some good success there, he's going to be in trouble. He's going to be vulnerable without access to his forehand completely unrestricted. The big forehand has been such an important facet for everybody to have success on clay over the last couple years. And for Alcaraz, that's a shot that really makes him click. And as for his other contemporaries up top, as I highlighted before, things aren't much better. Yannick Sinner got off to the dream start this year. And, you know, all of us were super excited to see how he'd look on clay, how this new Sinner would look on clay after a disappointing clay court season last year. He arguably got robbed in the semis of Monte Carlo because of that really bad no call on what should have been a double fault that gave him a double break lead in the decider against Tsitsipas and Monte Carlo. And then of course in Madrid, you know, the event where so many of these injuries happened, um, you started to see the signs of wear and tear on Sinner with the hip. As early as his second match in Madrid, he was already expressing a good deal of discomfort with that and now, by the sounds of it, word on the street is not very encouraging regarding his hip. Uh, not only just for Roland Garros, but in the bigger picture, it sounds like Sinner might have to miss a couple months here. At least Alcaraz has been able to start practicing again. The severity of Sinner's injury seems to be quite a bit more concerning right now. And with the start to the year that he had, that is such a bummer. You just hope for his sake that he's able to get back to 100%, get back on court, and pick up where he left off as soon as possible. Because while he was on court, 2024 really had the makings of a really special year for Yannick Sinner. So, you know, for his sake, obviously, you want to prioritize health if he's not at Roland Garros this year, so be it. Gotta be careful, obviously, with hip injuries. So... You know, you hope for the best for him. And then, rounding out this trio, still the world number one, Novak Djokovic. When I spoke on Novak's 2024 last in that Sunshine Double video, I was in a spot where, you know, I said I'm still not particularly worried about him. Since he exited his physical prime, Post-2016, he has tended to be pretty poor post-Australian Open, kind of use it as a runway to build himself back up before Rome and Roland Garros, where he really seems to put the foot back on the gas. And fast forward a little over a month, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a little bit alarmed, especially the nature of his loss in Rome to Tabilo. I know he didn't play great last year in Rome either, 
But obviously, he still made the quarter, and this is the first time Novak Djokovic, I think, has failed to make the quarters of Rome ever, if not 2006. So clearly, this has still been an event even in Novak's later years where he has to be smart scheduling, prioritize the majors, prioritize peaking for them. Rome has clearly still been an event he cares about, and... Obviously, this week he had the water bottle incident where he got hit in the head by accident by a metal water bottle. A lot of discourse around, you know, whether he was concussed, how that played into how he looked against Tabilo in his second match in Rome. I think given the nature of some of those misses and how jarring it was by, you know, just how not close they were, it's fair to attribute some of that potentially to a head injury from that impact in his own words he felt really uncoordinated out there and you know that does hold water but I don't think that's all that was at play there Djokovic I've rarely seen him check out of a match faster than he did in this match in Rome if you're going off times where he looked like he didn't want to be out there the only one that I think stands in the same class as this one is vienna in 2020 once he had his number one locked up and i think he lost like one and two to Senego. then this was right up there with that he seemed you know flat-footed not chasing down quite a few balls and even in neutral making life a lot easier for alejandro tabilo who you know to his credit having a career best year played a super clean match But this is a thing with Novak, I think, when he's playing poorly. A lot of the times, it coincides with, you know, body language. When Djokovic is bad, I think the best word for it, you know, Gil Gross has used this over the years, is despondent. He'll just kind of blatantly look like he doesn't really care, not in a frame of mind to really suffer, end up leaking way more errors than you're used to, and... You know, observing Djokovic in his matches this year, I still don't think there's really much that you can point to that's physical, that's any different from, you know, when he was rolling a year ago. He is, however, in rallies, leaking errors. A lot of uncharacteristic, unforced errors that in most years you just don't see him miss. And I think I've harped on motivation. I already picked up on that at the beginning of the year. I believe my take on it is in my last video about the Sunshine Double. And so I'm not really going to delve into the specifics of what might be at play there. But I will say this. He has come in to Roland Garros over the last three or so seasons with some subpar clay court seasons at least for his standards, and had it just not matter at all at Roland Garros. Most recently, last year, where, I don't know, you could argue that it was just as bad, if not a little bit worse, heading into the French, and obviously he turned it on for that event. So obviously, you have to stay wary of Djokovic, give him the deference that he has earned and he deserves. Of the three guys you'd probably most want to be Novak right now, not suffering with some type of physical ailment, at least as far as we know. His checkups on his head seem to be, you know, so far so good. And we are talking about a guy who went from outside the top 20 to number one in the world in the span of less than six months in 2018. So obviously it doesn't take much for him to find lightning in a bottle. But it goes without saying, vibes are not high with any of these three guys right now. And that leaves us in a really weird place right now as far as the men's game heading into the French Open. For one reason or the other, of course, it also could end up correcting itself in a best of five format. In the weeks leading up, maybe these guys get healthier. Whatever the case may be, but as things stand right now, if you're one of the guys in the next tier up who have really all had some pretty good success 
in Tsitsipas, Zverev, Kasparud, the guys that excel on the surface with, you know, Alcaraz and Sinner, you'd expect them to get better. In the coming years, they're probably going to stand in your way of winning a couple of these majors. So you'd be hard-pressed to find a better opportunity, at least on paper right now, to have your moment in the sun and break through, achieve major glory. And those three guys in particular, Tsitsipas, Rude, Zverev, they are obviously historically great clay quarters. Rude and Tsitsipas, of course, have had tremendous clay court seasons, at least the first half of it in Monte Carlo and Barcelona to this point where you'd say that they are well positioned to make a run at Roland Garros. Zverev, more disappointing this clay court season, but things are trending in a way that I feel he's going to win Rome, so all three should also head to Roland Garros with some good momentum from this year's clay court season as well. And that should make for this opportunity being even sweeter for them. In theory, you know, at least two, if not all three of these top three guys will regain form at some point, which obviously lessens your slice of the pie as far as your chances pretty much everywhere, unless it's Daniil Medvedev on a hard court. And so, you know, for anybody that has a pulse as far as their chances at winning Roland Garros, even if it's a sliver of a chance... The time to strike should be now, and I am looking at those three guys in particular, Tsitsipas, Zverev, and Rude. Feels like it's about as wide open a slam Roland Garros as you're going to get for a while. And I, for one, am super intrigued to see how it all unfolds in a couple of weeks. But that will do it for this video. If you made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. If you did, it would be much appreciated if you could drop a like. Help the video perform better in YouTube's algorithm. And also subscribe to the channel if you're not already. My apologies for the inactivity in 2024 in general. The last couple weeks saw me finally wrap up my undergrad journey. We finally walked at graduation. And so now with that in the rear view, I'm looking to turn that around this summer. Summer is typically when I've gotten busy on this channel. So... Stay tuned for more. Thank you all again so much for watching, and of course, I will see you all in the next one.